our speaker, Dr. Alexander Pavlov. He is a NASA scientist. He is an astrobiologist looking for life on Mars. So from here, I would ask Dr. Pavlov to take over and start his lecture. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, even though we have COVID. It's, it's no excuse, science will continue and going on. Um, so I will ask you, as you will have questions during my presentation, to send, send your uh, questions to Julia. Uh, and she will ask me, not, not just at the end, but you know, during the presentation, if there's some common questions, uh, so you guys will keep up of what I'm talking about. All right, so we are looking for life on Mars. Okay, if I only can move this. So before we start talking about how we look for life on Mars, it's, it's, it's important to ask ourselves how we actually define life. And what NASA does, it says uh, that the definition of life is the capacity uh, for self-replication and the capacity to, uh, to undergo the Darwinian evolution. The classical definition is that a self-sustaining uh, chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Very complicated uh, definition, but very kind of broad. And so what that actually means is that if you look in nature and you look at uh, fire, right? Fire can move, fire can grow, but fire doesn't evolve. So if you if you have a fire tomorrow, it will still burn at the same temperature if you put the same wood in, in the same conditions. And our ancestors uh, millions of years ago in the Stone Age will, will have the same fire as we have it right now. It grows, it, um, uh, but it's not evolving. The same example, another example would be a salt crystal, which you uh, can grow uh, in a, you know, in some salt solution. You see how it looks, you know, it has particular shape, uh, cubic shape in this case, right? So if you take uh, salt crystals from ancient rocks from billions of years ago, it's again going to be the same salt crystal. It's not going to be more complicated, more weird and more weird shapes. It's not evolving. So with life, what we think about what NASA is, uh, how life is defined is, it's not only growing, it's not only uh, replicating itself like soul, soul crystals, right? But it's also evolving. It was used to be a very small microorganisms and now we have complex ones. So that's, that's how NASA defines life. The problem is that that's even NASA is, is defining life this way. It's not, um, uh, it's not, hang on a second, sorry. Uh, it's not uh, looking uh, for life using this definition. Uh, because we simply, if we go to uh, different planets, if we go to Mars, or if we go to Europa, or if we go to Titan, we simply don't have enough time or funding just to wait uh, for uh, something to evolve, you know, for something to grow. You know, we usually we're very limited on the time we can spend on the planet. Can be <clears throat> can be several months or years, but certainly not centuries. You know, right? You know, so we have to go and we have to look for something, some specific evidence that life was there, right? And this is an example on the slide is uh, the what's called a Martian meteorite, uh, which was a, a very uh, how to put it high profile story about twenty years ago. When uh, this is a rock which came from Mars. Uh, and uh, uh, when people looked at it carefully, they saw this uh, peculiar elongated structures under the microscope, which looked like a, <clears throat> like a micro fossils. Uh, and turned out to be not true, turned out to be this is not a life of any kind, but this is giving you an example that we're not looking for the actual microorganism, but we're looking for the, uh, for the trace of it, like what uh, what traces that such microorganisms would live in the rock. So we can determine, aha, uh -huh, you know, this microorganism was there. Okay, so we're looking for traces of life. 
uh, all life, we have only, only one example of life, right? We only have life on Earth so far, as we, we, which we found. And all life we found it, you know, from elephant, whale, down to, um, down to some smallest, smallest, smallest bacteria, uh, shares the same common, uh, uh, same common thing. It, 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 it is consistent out of the organic molecules. So most of your body is water. It's a 60% water, right? But about 20% of that is organic molecules. It's a carbon molecules from carbon atoms. Carbon atoms link together and they're linked in particular forms, uh, in particular patterns. And, and depending how they are linked, we call them in different biological classes. It can be the lipids or fats, right? Cholesterol, which uh, you know, I'm very familiar with. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, carbohydrates, sugar, right? Proteins, which is made out of amino acids, that's your muscle. Nucleic acids, that's the ones which, the, uh, which we usually refer to DNA and RNA. So <clears throat> all life as we know it is built on those, uh, on those uh, biological micromolecules. We cannot look for the carbohydrates, but we can hope to find other, like lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And if we find them, nothing can make it but biology. So uh, we will say, huh, you know, life was, was present in that particular uh, environment on that particular planet. So what we're actually looking for on Mars as well, so, you know, since there is no evidence of advanced life, uh, no green, little green men out there, um, but there is certainly a good possibility for microbial life in the past. What we're looking for complex organic molecules. So this is an example of that like in the corner, right? This is a benzene out there. So as you see this carbon atoms linked, linked together. This is actually not a complex one. The complex one will be on the next slide, which is, this is what we call molecular biomarkers. So those uh, hexagonal uh, kind of structures linked together. This is actually carbon atoms, you know? So on the left, you can see the names of the microorganisms, like diatoms. And each microorganism has specific set of this complex organic molecules. And those, are, those complex organic molecules are very, very stubborn, you know, meaning that the uh, microorganisms can die, can die millions of years ago, but you still in the rock where that particular microorganism lived, we will still find the molecule. So the cell already is not there, it's destroyed, you know, but we still will see pieces of that, of those organic molecules. And we can tell, aha, uh -huh, you know, the, back in the past, in this rock, there's this particular micro, microorganism lived. So this is a much more reasonable strategy uh, for, uh, for the Mars exploration to look and to look for this particular molecules. Are there any questions, Julie, so far? You're muted. No, everyone is just very carefully listening to you. All right. Okay. So um, there are different types of molecules. Molecules can be big. Organic molecules can be very, very small. So, you know, the one approach is to look for those organic molecules in the rocks, right, of, as an evidence of, of some past life. The other one is to look at the atmosphere. To look at the atmosphere, so some simple organic molecules like methane. Methane is the simplest organic molecule, and you hear a lot about it on um, here because of the global warming. It's a greenhouse gas on Earth. But what's important is that on Earth, almost all methane, ninety-five percent, is done by microbes. It can be done either on the rice paddy fields or in the stomach of a cow. But it's, it's done by fermenters by by this small methanogenic bacteria, which produces methane. Methane is very small, it escapes in the atmosphere. So if we find methane in the atmosphere, then we, it, is, it is a very interesting indicator that maybe uh, there, is a, there is microorganisms living in the soil and they release methane into the atmosphere. This approach uh, works not only for Mars, but also for uh, exoplanets. People who are looking for exoplanets outside our solar system, they, look, they, they don't have the, um, the luxury to go to, that, to those exoplanets. They can only look in the telescope. So this is what they're looking for. They're looking for 
biogenic gases like methane. But we can also look for this biogenic uh, gas on Mars as well. So that's another strategy. <clears throat> so why Mars is so important to us in biology? Well, first of all, it's, it's very close. So we actually can test a lot. There are dozens of missions to Mars. You know, you don't have to wait a decade for a next launch to, like we have to wait for Europa or for Titan or for uh, anything else on the outer parts of the solar system. We can launch pretty much every two years a mission to Mars. So we can explore it really, really rigorously. Mars is in many ways similar to Earth, right? It's rocky. It's, you know, if you look at the composition, what is it made out of? It's actually very, very similar to, uh, to Earth. And yet it's very different. It's very cold, it's very dry. It doesn't have ocean on the surface. So if we find life there, then that will be actually uh, will mean that, uh, that life is a very common phenomenon in the galaxy. Because if in one solar system, you know, two, two planets, you can have two separate originations of life on Earth and somewhere else, then ch chances are that this is a very common thing. In, in, you know, as long as you have this rocky planets, you can form life anywhere. So that's why it's important. So having said that, Mars surface is a very harsh place for Earth-like life to live. So if you put any advanced life without kind of any protection, it will die immediately. Um, some microorganisms can live though, but the reason why it's so harsh is because it's cold. It's uh, colder than Antarctica. Uh, you know, not, it's not uncommon on Mars to have temperatures like minus 50, minus 60 Celsius. <clears throat> it's very, very dry. So if you put something, um, you know, the, so the cells, they can desiccate, they can dry out. There's low atmospheric pressure, which also means that, um, you know, if you put something like water rich, it can boil immediately. You know, uh, gases comes, comes out and can burst the cell. It has UV radiation because it's a, it has very thin atmosphere. So you know, solar, cosmic, uh, solar, solar radiation goes directly to the surface and has ionizing radiation as well. They're very nasty stuff, you know, so that's why the surface is very harsh to live. However, oh, back. there is plenty of water. And that's what was discovered uh, back in 2001 first and then confirmed in 2009 uh, Phoenix by Phoenix mission, which landed in the, at the mid latitudes and decided to do a scoop as on the left slide. And you can see that ice is really, really close to the surface. It's frozen, but it's there. You know, it wasn't a particular location, which they choose, you know, the, you know so these locations can be anywhere. They just landed and, oh, you know, there is, there is ice out there. Uh, on the right, this was what we call the recurring slope linear, you know. So this is a <coughs> seasonal phenomena, which occurs um, on, um, during the warm period on the warm slopes of Mars, you all of a sudden have those dark streaks appearing on the slopes, which uh, most people uh, kind of think that there has to involve water because it's seasonal, you know? So it looks like it is like some kind of a watering condense on the slope which can come out on, uh, come out on the surface. Uh, Dr. Pavlov, we got some questions, if you Go want ahead. to uh, address some of them. Go ahead. So, uh, I can read several of them to you and you decide which one you want to okay. uh, answer in the water. Yeah. Yeah. Does water have to mean there is life? Uh, have, is it possible to test the ice for microorganisms? Mm -hmm. Which Earth microorganisms can survive on Mars right now? Okay. So uh, water is a prerequisite of life, right? You know, without water, Earth-like, Earth-like life would not survive. So the fact that Mars has, has water in the frozen form or periodically in liquid form or had liquid water in the past, certainly, uh, certainly enhances chances that there would be, uh, uh, there would be or have been uh, active biosphere on Mars. So that, that's certainly true. But this, this also doesn't mean it has to be, right? Because if it's without water, you can't have life as we know it. With water, Maybe, maybe not, because besides water, you also need to have nutrients. You need to have 
uh, specific constraints on, uh, you know, on the pressure, on the, uh, uh, on the radiation exposure, et cetera. So this is the point of exploration. That's why there are certain proposals to go to the polar regions of Mars and drill the ice. You know, so that's still, still to come. You know, and so far, there was no samples of ice analyzed. We haven't done that. Um, and what was our question? Which microorganisms can live right now? Yes. <clears throat> so uh, there are several model micro microorganisms which, which we think would survive. I mean, we obviously didn't test it, but we simulated um, this type of, in the, in the Mars simulation chambers, uh, uh, there's some, one of the organisms is uh, uh, methanogenic bacteria from Siberian permafrost. Uh, so, you know, the, this type of bacteria can potentially survive on Mars. Uh, Radioresistant bacteria, this is bacteria which are extremely tolerant to radiation. And in fact, their tolerance is so incredible, they can live in a nuclear reactor. So they can certainly have the capability of surviving on the, on the shallow subsurface of Mars. Uh, and some holophiles, the, um, the microorganisms which are like salt, particularly. So um, the uh, Mars surface environment is very salty. It has a lot of <coughs> uh, uh, perchlorate salts, uh, and sodium chloride salts. Uh, so whatever, whatever microorganisms uh, live or potent, have potential to live on Mars, it has to be able to tolerate high, high amounts of salts. And luckily on Earth, we have plenty of organi organisms which are doing exactly that. So let's continue. And you keep accumulating questions, right? All right. <clears throat> so here's an example uh, of Earth microorganisms, how they're dealing, for example, with the uh, with UV radiation. Uh, this is the algae, uh, which is living essentially in the rock in a very desiccated environment. So you can see, so just a couple of millimeters under the soil, you know, you can see like this green layer of algae. Apparently, even this a couple of millimeters is enough to protect uh, to protect the microorganisms from UV radiation. So there are ways how um, microorganisms on, on Earth can um, go around this, uh, this high radiation environment, which will be a problem on Mars. <coughs> Here's an example how, the, the, uh, you know, this is a, called a red algae. Uh, uh, this is uh, microorganisms which are essentially living in the snow. You know, so they can uh, be active growth at minus 20 Celsius. And there is, I don't have a picture, but there is a, a limit of about minus 30 Celsius uh, uh, for methanogenic bacteria to grow in the Siberian permafrost. So there are ways for, uh, for terrestrial microorganisms to overcome cold temperatures. That's why, even though when I say that Martian surface is very harsh, um, terrestrial microorganisms, they live in pretty harsh environments too. They don't like it. Life, life prefers to live in the, you know, in the nice and comfortable conditions, but they certainly are capable of, you know, so, so that's give us a lot of hope that the active biosphere can be present right now on Mars. <clears throat> so there are two basic approaches to search for life on Mars. There's a, uh, you can search either for extinct life, the life uh, which uh, was active uh, many, many millions of billions of years ago, billions of years ago. And in this case, you obviously you're not looking for the cells, but you're looking for the remnants, something which survived for a long period of time, or you're looking for extant life. So extant life, you're actually searching for microorganisms or for their organic molecules, but but the ones which are kind of easily destroyed. So you have to find some really complex ones, which are indicative that life has been present right, right now, right, right within the last, like say, 100 years. So current and near future missions to Mars focus primarily on the extinct life. This is a NASA policy. I'm not going to go in there, but uh, this is what the approach which was adopted for the last uh, decade. 
uh, that is kind of changing and there will be focused more on the extant life. But for now, current mission and immediate future missions are focusing on the extinct life. In other words, people are looking <coughs> for the remnants of the ancient, uh, ancient life, ancient organic molecules. Here's the logic of that approach kind of in more detail. When you look at the Martian surface, uh, I told you that there's <coughs> plenty of evidence of water, right? There is water mostly frozen, and occasionally you have kind of uh, maybe some liquid water on the slope running. But if you look at the ancient terrain of Mars, you have evidence that water was everywhere, and it was liquid for a long period of time. You know, so this is an example, it's actually from one of the first missions to Mars back in the 60s of the last century. Right, there's a mariner's water from, uh, you know, and they look at the valley network of the ancient terrain on the Martian surface. You see those like little streaks on the left, you know, this is, shows you a delta uh, of the river. I'm sorry, not the river. It, this is, uh, shows you that the river was not only present on the surface of Mars, but actually had time to develop this network of, um, of channels to, to, go in, uh, to go into the, uh, kind of collecting in and then go just going down the hill so that means that it cannot be just like a parcel of water the water has to uh, be on the presence of the surface for an extended period of time we don't see that right now we don't have active rivers on mars right now but in the past they were so that means that uh, mars was warm back in the past was warm with plenty of liquid water so the proponents of, of this extinct life search on mars saying well we don't know whether there is an active biosphere um, now, uh, but given the fact that the climate was so much warmer and wetter back in the past, it's, it's very likely there was some microbial life back in the past, right? You know, so <clears throat> yes, uh, it's, it's not, it, it may be not as active right now, but back in the past, it, it could have been much more vigorous. So that, let's look for it. So that's the approach which current missions are being uh, taking. I'm on time. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I, I'm, I'm going to speed up a little. Um, so here is the current Mars missions relevant to the search of flight, right? I'm a part of the uh, uh, Mars Science Laboratory, which is uh, uh, just in short MSL. This is a rover, and that's shown right here in the middle, right? It, is, it was in the sur surface of Mars already eight years, which is amazing because the uh, normal operation was supposed to be one year only. It's eight times extended. Um, there is also ExoMars. So this is actually a European mission. Uh, and NASA is a part of this, and Russia is a part of it. Uh, the, uh, this is a combination of two. There is a rover and there is an orbiter right here. It's called terrestrial uh, TGO, which is called Trace Gas, uh, Trace Gas Observatory. So, TGO is active right now. So it's looking for the gases like methane uh, in the atmosphere of Mars. You know? So this is, was active since 2016. ExoMars was supposed to launch in 2020, actually it was supposed to launch first of 2018, but now it's postponed all the way to down to tw uh, 2022. Mars 2020, the Perseverance rover, was just launched well, like last week on Thursday. Uh, and it's on its way to Mars. So all current and currently planned missions look for organic molecules as the primary evidence of life on Mars. Okay. Just uh, Dr. Pavel, just a second. We have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, are there better possibilities of finding life on some parts of Mars rather than others? Very good question. And again, it goes back into the strategy of what you're looking for, right? So if you're looking for extinct life, you will be looking, you deliberately land in the area where you know that this area is ancient. So you're not going to look for, the, for something uh, uh, you know, in, in the ice, which is relatively recent, right? If you want to look for something which was alive billions of years ago, instead you will find the ancient surface, which was fully cr cratered and uh, uh, from the geological standpoint, we know that it was around for at least billions of years, right? <clears throat> if you're looking for extant life, then you will be looking at uh, in the areas uh, where you have water right now and 
maybe not as cold or at least periodically uh, warms up, you know, because microorganisms don't need to be in a good conditions all time. They like it, but in order for them to survive and to, um, to replicate, all you need to do is to have like a couple months of the warm temperature. Uh, and and there, so there are, yes, there are such areas. Uh, there are such areas in the mid latitude where, where you have shallow ice and you have, uh, uh, during the summer months, you know, temperature can go about freezing. So this will be one, there will be areas to look for. Another one is this recurring slope linear. So the warm slopes, and this unfortunately hard to reach because those slopes, you know, have uh, problems, you know, when you're landing, you know, how you're gonna climb there. So it's always like, um, you know, when you're arguing, you know, you want to land at this location versus that location, you have to factor in risk, uh, risk and benefit, right? So you identify your strategy. If you're looking for extinct life, you're, you're not going to where ice is, right? If you want to extend life, you want to go where ice is, you know, so, so that's a long, long answer to the question. Uh, there is another question. Have we had a chance to actually examine a piece of ice from Mars for either extinct or extant no. uh, life traces? No. The, this is a future. This is you, uh, for you guys. Well, hopefully before you. <laughs> I, hope, I hope to live through this. You know, so, but there is certain proposals to go uh, and to drill uh, into, uh, uh, into ice in the polar regions. Uh, but not for the next probably um i'll say for the next not for the next 10 years so because uh, you know so the current plan current plan from uh for uh, nasa's plan is the priority is to return sample back to earth and they are going to be returning uh this ancient piece of ancient mars there might be a small mission uh, planning you know to go uh, to the polar region before that but that's still remain to be seen. So that's about how much I can tell. <laughs> you know, so uh, here's the, uh, just to give an idea that, you know, whatever we have right now, this, those, those great rovers, this was not a straight path, right? You know, so there was an evolution here. This, this just shows you how the complexity of the rovers increase, you know, like you have what you have in 1996 and then you have Spirit and Opportunity rovers, uh, which were, fascinating uh, uh you know fascinating rovers which uh, worked for decades more than a decade on the martian surface but they had solar batteries so curiosity which is part of the msl which is on the right was the first rover with nuclear power source uh it can operate uh day and night if it wanted to and it's uh, certainly much more much heavier so this is like a comparison uh, between the uh, previous row and the current one, which is operational. The, the one Mars 2020 is actually very similar to Curiosity in size. So um, there is not, not much increase in terms of, um, in terms of total weight uh, comparing to what's operating right now. But there is a huge, huge change between Mars exploration rovers and Curiosity. Uh, so this is kind of like, Curiosity is the size of a Mini Cooper essentially. Okay, so this is what, um, this is what the primary tool looks like and what it can do. Um, it has, besides, you know, the primary focus for this talk is obviously looking for life, but that's not the only thing which Curiosity does. Curiosity also has um, sensors to monitor water. Uh, it has, <coughs> it's looking for meteorology. It looks for, uh, uh, you know, for the, uh, for, weather, for weather on Mars in this particular location. Uh, so uh, it has a lot into it, you know, so this, this kind of shows you more of the scientific um, payload. One, perhaps one of the most interesting, well, I won't say most interesting, but uh, the biggest upgrades of, of Curiosity is the ability to drill. So on the right, it shows you this robotic arm with a drill on it, you know, so this is a big deal, you know, so if you look, at the drill holes, uh, which Curiosity did in the in the station rocks, you can immediately see why. If you look at the at the rock itself, it's kind of rusty. It's kind of uh, kind of sometimes reddish color, sometimes uh, kind of brownish color. 
But as soon as you drill in, just a couple centimeters below, you see that material changes, even visually changes, becomes gray. In some cases, in some cases not. You know, but what it tells you that whatever we see from the orbit or in the telescope on the surface of Mars, it's not what actually what Mars is. If it takes only a centimeter or so, you go below the surface and it's completely different uh, chemical composition, that tells you we have to be very careful when we uh, evaluating something about the Mars when we're just looking straight at the surface. That happens for good reason is because uh, as I uh, pointed earlier, the surface of Mars is really um, a harsh place. It's uh, full of radiation, uh, it's full of oxidants, you know, so whatever this, you have this very surface of the rock, which we see is very often oxidized. That's why the Mars has a reddish color. Uh, but it takes just just a couple of centimeters below it, and all of a sudden you have a completely different, uh, completely different world. So, <clears throat> whenever we're evaluating uh, something for the ancient, uh, for the remnants of the ancient life, we do want to have this capability to go away from the harsh environment, to go something which will have more preservation. So this is exactly what uh, Curiosity is doing, and this is what Mars 2020 will be doing as well. Let me go back. Oh, here we go. So actually, the, the instrument which is analyzing organics is this, is uh, sample analysis of Mars, SIM, right here. Okay, kind of in the belly. This is actually cool, you know, it's shooting laser, you know, uh, shooting laser at the rock. And you look at the, uh, at the point of the quantum of the laser, you, um, you evaporate the rock. And you can see uh, by spectral lines of this, you know, the composition, kind of the bulk composition of the rock. Okay, but this is not what this talk is about. So this is, this is in more details what actually uh, sample uh, analysis on Mars, SAM, uh, the ones, that's the instrument which analyzing for these organic molecules would look like. You know, here's a, it's actually <clears throat> a multi, multi-step, um, uh, uh, it, it has several instruments in it, within this, this is kind of the general view. It has got chromatograph, tuning laser spectrometer, and quadrupole mass spectrometer all inside that nice little box. So what's the principle of work? How does it analyze it? So it's actually kind of like what we, uh, what we do when we cook uh, anything, something in the microwave. What do we do? We, we put, uh, put some cold, I don't know, frozen dinner or if you want or something and then we, we, we start heating it up and it's heating it up <clears throat> it warms up and we start smelling stuff what we're smelling because smelling because organic molecules so that's the same principle as uh, sam is doing as well it has it drills well sam is not drills but this robotic arms drills and transfer powder into those little cups in the sample uh sand manipulation system Right in those cups, and then those cups, one individual cup, is goes into the. I uh, couldn't show it here, uh, but it goes into the oven, and you heat it to specific temperature. It's actually cooking it, and what organic molecules are going to go out, out of that soil, and then we can detect them with this instrument. Okay, so it's actually, uh, I just will mention it, but the advantage of CM was also that it has what's called diuretization chemistry. So problem with the cooking is that when you start cooking, and you start heating up the, that, uh, that soil, that Asian soil, that some organic molecules are going to break. They are stable, but they're not that stable, right? Because you're heating them to you know, 600 degrees Celsius, right? <coughs> up to, you know, you, you actually can go even further than that, but typically it's 400, 600. Um, degrees. So some of them are going to break and, and you lose information what was originally in the rock. So what sample analysis of Mars is doing, what SAM is doing is it has actually a special chemical with it, uh, which is called a derivatization agent, which you spray onto the soil. And if you do it, it will react with organic molecules and make them much more easier to get off. So it's like a, I don't know, detergent, I guess. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the probably the uh, the analog for that, you know, so, so by itself, organic molecules are stuck in the soil and you'll have to heat it a lot and they'll break. 
But if you pre-treat it with this chemical, then it will come out much easier at a much lower temperature and we can uh, still see it essentially intact. So that's the idea. Okay. So what we found uh, so far? We got oh. a couple of questions here too. Go ahead. So first of all, why is the chemical composition matter when we search for life? Okay. All right. So the chemical composition matters. Oops. Didn't go wrong. So I guess we are right here, right? The chemical composition of the rock or you or rock. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think this one. You know, so chemical composition matters because again, since our only analog for the planet uh, with life is Earth, we'll look what what we'll find in ancient uh, uh, in ancient rocks on Earth, right? Like what uh, you know, what where is most of the organic <clears throat> molecules are being stored? If you look at the ancient minerals, some minerals have a tendency to accumulate more than the others, right? Like phyllosilicates, for example, they can have much more organic content than some basaltic rock. So it does matter if you see some volcanic rock and basalts, you know, or granite, you know, it is highly unlikely there will be any kind of bug in there or a piece of any organic matter. But if you have sedimentary rocks, you know, something which is deposited in some ancient lake, right, then chances are that organic matter, some, some organic molecules can get into it. So by doing preliminary understanding, like, you know, with this laser, you know, shooting around and seeing, you know, well, what kind of composition of this uh, minerals is? What kind of minerals is in the first place? Maybe I don't need to, maybe we don't need to spend resources to detect organics there. We'll save it for better one, which in our view, we can accumulate more organic based on terrestrial analogs. Any more? Thank you. Another one, <clears throat> is it true to, that you have to control the rover at 120,000 ping to 1,360,000 ping. I don't know on the answer to the question. To be <laughs> so honest. whether they have a server on Mars. Yeah, so, I, I do not know the exact numbers. And, you know, we can, we can look it up if, uh, if, if need be. But the, the way how a uh, rover is being operated, uh, it's, it's not in real time, right? You know, so I can tell you a few things how, how, that, how that's being done. It, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it would be ideal if there will be an astronaut really on, the, on the orbit or there and, and directing it, you know, directing for, uh, for analysis right away, right on the spot. But that's not the case. You know, usually what happens is, well, not usually, but the standard procedure is that, you know, the, the rover stays, in place and takes pictures around. And the absolute worst uh, case scenario is the, if the rover is gonna get stuck. Why do we want rovers in the first place? We want for, uh, rovers because of mobility, right? You know, if you just have a lander on Mars, you can only sample things around you. You know, I know Mars is a very diverse, uh, diverse place, right? So it might be very interesting uh, some microfossils maybe 10 meters away from you and you will never be able to, to detect it. So rover, the very first, first thing is, 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 is mobility. It actually can drive to a particular location. But the very first concern is safety. So whenever you, you take, take plenty of pictures and you identify what is the safest route to a particular location where you're going to sample. So this is, this is, a, this is done days before the actual movement will occur. And then, then you, uh, you send this information to, to the rover and it drives very, very slowly, sometimes several, several meters at the most. Uh, you know, so just to give an idea it's how slow it is, I mean, during these eight years, the total number of, uh, it, it, it just traveled maybe like by so like 13 or 14 miles total. You know, so, so it moves very, very slowly. I do not know exactly uh, what you were asking in terms of number of, you know, but this is not a real time information exchange. This is what I'm getting at. You know, you, you have to make your case that, hey, this particular rock or, or stone, whatever that is, is very interesting. You know, this is what scientific benefits are if we go and look at it. And this is what risk assessment is. You know, 
and and if your if your theory is is a sound compared to the others and uh, it's within the um, uh, you know is, is good in terms of resources usage then you know this is how that goes it's 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 a strong debate how how does rover where that will go you have to prove your case that you want to study this particular resident than the other one so uh, and one more question about chemistry and chemical analysis. Why do organic molecules break by heat? Well, any, any molecules itself, it has a, a, a bond strength. So when carbon links out with carbon molecule, uh, it's not absolute, right? You know, it, it, any, any chemical bond has a threshold after which it, it will break off. Now, what we're looking at here is, is uh, with the with the biomolecules, if I'll go back right here, you see that? <clears throat> it's actually even easier than that, right? Because you can break just one, uh, a couple of this uh, hexagonals or octagonals uh, structures, you know, even not to fully uh, destroy organic molecules. But if you break enough of this, you will not be able to say where this organic molecule come from. Okay. So when you're heating it up, the atoms in the molecule, they start to move uh, harder and harder, and eventually they can break the bond. And the more complex organic molecules, the easier it is to find somewhere where the bond is weaker than in the others. You know? And then you'll break it and you'll lose information what this original molecule was first. So the least you heat the sample, the better for the preservation of the original molecule. The problem is, if you, if you don't provide enough heat, nothing will come out. So this is a, is a very kind of a tender balance between your complexity of your signal versus how much it can get out. You will need to have something to, to analyze what's in it, but you don't want to heat it too much, so all, every single or, or a significant amount of bonds will destroy it and you wouldn't recognize what the molecule was, okay? All right, where were we? So, <clears throat> so, so far, so far, uh, MSL actually find, found organic molecules. It found chlorinated organic molecules, which so called chlorobenzene. I just pulled this image right here. It's not, nothing pleasant about it. Uh, and some sulfurized organic molecules at very low concentration. Even though this is organic and it's consistent, would be consistent with life, it's not a definitive proof of life because we did not find anything more complex so far. We didn't find amino acids or uh, any significant fatty acids uh, in, in Mars. There are different theories why that is, but this is what the, where the current research is. We did find organic for the first time uh, definitively. MSL did find it but found that low concentration and rather simple one, not complex one. So we can definitively say that this is an evidence of life because there is other ways like meteorites can bring this type of organic molecules on the Martian surface. This is the price you pay when you're going uh, to, um, to look for extinct life, right? You don't look for the actual microorganism in this case, you're looking for the uh, trace of that ancient life, right? You know, so, we found something, but we can't, can't say that this is a proof of life. With methane, <coughs> we found also uh, something interesting. We found the methane variability uh, in this Gale, Gale crater. Uh, and this is an unresolved mystery. Uh, we are still working, trying to understand why is it wearing. Uh, why is it wearing only uh, near the surface? It looks like it's seasonal. Methane increases and decreases uh, right near the surface because in the rest of the atmosphere up high, it's not seen. It may be indicative that microorganisms are actually operating and, and uh, releasing some methane to the atmosphere, but it's still work in progress. So this is it and I'll finish here and I'll take questions. Send questions to Julia and she'll read it to everybody. Yes. Right. So the question is, we found some amino acids on asteroids, but not on Mars. Uh, what could be the reason? 
Right. So again, amino acids by themselves is not uh, evidence of life, right? You know, the uh, evidence of life would be if you found not only amino acids, but amino acids in, um, uh, you know, with uh, specific, in spe uh, specific types of amino acids, like uh, all life on earth using specific types of amino acids and in, in, uh, in asteroids and meteorites, uh, amino acids are, you know, they're not preferentially uh, linked to the bio amino acids, which we see on earth. So with amino acid analysis, I mean, discovery of any amino acids would be great, but to have it definitively say that this is, this amino acid means life, you will see that all of a sudden you'll have specific type of amino acids over and over and over again. Then it would be a question, well, if it's a meteorite, then why we don't see others? So then it will be, you know, so if you see preferentially particular amino acid, then uh, that, that's indicative, you know, of life, particular set of amino acids. Uh, but just discovering amino acids in the first place, that will be a huge first step. And Milena asks, how does the drill, when the drill makes the hole, how does the dust actually get into the sample manipulation system? Well, it's kind of, it sucks in. With the, with the reverse, uh, you drill in, and then with the reverse, uh, a reverse movement of the drill, it actually puts, puts, puts the material inside and sucks it in. Uh, and then, um, well, you know, so there are several analysis right away, you know, because it doesn't go right away into SAM. You first you look at the, um, at the mineral, uh, mineral composition of the, of the soil. Uh, that's the first analysis, and only after that, you put it into the oven, into the uh, into the sample holders for the oven and uh, for the sample. But yes, it's a zhink, and then zhink, reverse and it comes in. Um, Zoe asks, how do we know that life even does leave traces and doesn't dissolve or disappear in some other way? Okay, so time? yeah, I mean that's a good question. Uh, the the, again, our only analog, the only example of life is Earth. You know? And on Earth, we know that there are traces of life in the ancient rocks, in the Archean rocks, which are 3.6 billion years ago. So despite the fact that Earth has this weather cycle and tectonics and all this stuff which can destroy those traces, it's still there. We still can go, we can drill in the ancient um, uh, rocks in Australia, in, in Canada, um, uh, in South Africa, you know, and we can date them with uh, different uh, potassium argon methods and, uh, uh, and other methods, you know, which include just uh, the um, radioactive nuclides. So we know how old those rocks are. And then uh, you look for organic matter and you look for essentially those biomarkers. And you see biomarkers, which are 2.7 billion years ago. Right, so the logic here is, if we go to the ancient outcrop on Mars, and if Mars is, was dry and cold in the, for a long period of time, it's actually will be even better preserved. So, if if Mars was cold and uh, was warm and wet back in the past, as we see by the, all these video channels uh, and other deposits, you know, the, which uh, Curiosity also found the conglomerate deposits, uh, and life was present there, chances are. And good chances are that we will be able to see those, uh, those, those traces of these organic molecules even from billions of years ago. So that's the logic. Thank you. Another question from Queen. Do we plan to send a rover to one of the Martian poles, north or south, to search for extant life in the polar ice? Not currently. So the current the proposals which I'm aware of uh, and I'm not going to details is, is that this is just a, people proposing lenders, meaning not a rovers, but just a lender to drill into the ice. Um, uh, but nothing funded so far, <laughs> you know, so. So, so far, so far we have uh, currently Curiosity, which is MSL mission, uh, which, is, which was there for a long time. Uh, hopefully it will be for another couple of years, I hope. Uh, then there is uh, Mars 2020, which will become operational soon, like in 
uh, maybe what, seven months, eight months, if everything will be fine. Uh, there will be ExoMars in 2022. So that one is interesting because it's actually, uh, this is the first, uh, uh, first one which actually can drill down to one and a half meters, which turned out to be maybe very, very, very important because uh, both MSL and Mars 2020 drills only five centimeters. And problem with that is that even though, as I showed, the, the color of the rock changes, but the surface of Mars also bombarded by this really, really nasty stuff, and really this is the cosmic rays, which are penetrating deeper into meters in. So some concern is that some of the organic, organic molecules can be broken up by that. Um, you know, this is part of my research, actually. Uh, you know, but ExoMars is going to go below that, that level at one and a half meters, and we'll have a chance to look at that pristine material. You know, so that will be a very interesting mission. So we'll see, we'll see, hopefully, uh, you know, that will be successful in landing. You know, but no, um, to, towards the ice, nothing is funded so far. No? We should fund it. <laughs> yeah, we should. <laughs> we should persuade some people yeah, to do it. Well, yeah, yeah, if you should taxpayers, go for it. <laughs> so, two questions here. Was Mars created mostly the same way as Earth? And another one is about the color of the sky. Mm -hmm. There is some discussion um, in chat whether the sky is black as on the moon or whether it actually has some color. Well, the sky, if you're on the surface of Mars, is also going to be bluish. I mean, bluish because of the Rayleigh scattering, right? You know, so like, it's not as thick, you know, so you won't have as you know, the beautiful cumulus, uh, cumulus nimbus clouds, and that's not happening because you have very little water. Uh, but there are some clouds uh, on Mars, uh, and overall, it's going to have a, a bluish, a bluish color. Yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> so. And in regard to Mars being created about the same way as Earth, Mars being what? I'm sorry. Um, was Mars was Mars created mostly oh, the same we, way as Earth? Yes. Yes. So this is a this are the inner uh, terrestrial planets. We will call them. You know, this is uh, uh, Mars and Venus, our sister planets. So their composition is very very similar uh, in terms of like overall abundance. Like here's much how much silica, how much oxygen, how much uh, iron you have. You know. So obviously there are differences because Mars is smaller. <clears throat> and <clears throat> doesn't have active tectonics, you know, so no, no plate motion, uh, motion right now as, as on Earth because, you know, no active, uh, no uh, active hydrosphere, no oceans. Uh, but if you just look at the basaltic rocks, they're very, very similar. Very, very similar. So I, uh, the idea is that <clears throat> they, were, they were formed from the same type of asteroidal material uh, all three planets, Venus, Venus, Earth, Earth, and Mars. Yes, and about, about at the same time, about like 4.6 billion years ago. Um, does Mars have um, a molten iron core, the same as Earth does? Yeah, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this is part, part, uh, part of research to what degree, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the core is fractionated. So, why the why the the core is usually you know, is iron comparing to uh, in, in those planets is because you had what's called differentiation, right? You have a uniform material uh, from the from the asteroid, and then what happens is uh, over time, as it's molten, the heavy uh, heavy material like iron and nickel is just migrating towards the center and forming the core. It's called iron core. Uh, the bigger the planet, the more of this uh, fractionation occurs. So yes, people were claiming that, that there is a, uh, that there is the iron core on Mars, you know, just, just not as much as on Earth, just because of the size of the planet is smaller. Um, does Martian atmosphere have different levels? Yes, it has. Uh, it has the troposphere, just like we do. It has the, uh, and has a stratosphere. It's much thinner, so if you think about it, if you look at the like a cold mass of gas, you know, if you have like a one centimeter, one centimeter, so <clears throat> above us is about one kilogram of mass, 
you know, so two pounds, right? One <clears throat> on Mars is about 16 grams. So the atmosphere is much, much, much thinner than ours. But yes, it still has the troposphere where you have, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, some amount of weather, if you wish, you know, some, you know, the dust devils and uh, uh, occasionally even snow. And, so, and then you have a stratosphere, which is relatively stable, um, uh, stable layer, just like on Earth. Can a rocky planet have a molten core that is not made out of iron? Uh, molten core, which is not made out of iron. Um, I would say so. I mean, the, if you, I guess it depends on the age of the planet because um, you, can have, uh, you can have heat uh, uh, generated uh, you know, in the in the middle of the planet by by different mechanisms. I mean, obviously by radioactive uh, by the decay of radioactive elements. <clears throat> you know, but you also can have it uh, by the uh, uh, tidal forces. So this is uh, more like Europa, uh, more like Io. Uh, you know, when it's the most volcanic, the most uh, volcanic uh, place in the solar system. You know, you don't. Uh, there is in, in the the source of heat is is essentially tide uh, is a tidal heating by the giant planets, so you can do it that way. I guess you know this is not the case for the for terrestrial planets. Terrestrial planets you, you do have iron in, in the middle. And we will take one more question: What causes the different climates on Mars? Uh, can I have one counter question? Is is that for the present day or for the past? I don't know. Present. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll, I'll answer this. Uh, one of the mysteries of Mars is the is is exactly what uh, we we're talking about that the uh, the ancient ancient climate was so uh, so much warmer and wetter than it is today. Right now, climate models, if you go back in past, they have troubles explaining that. So the the favorite hypothesis was that the amount of greenhouse gases on ancient Mars was much, much higher than it is today. But the problem is, no matter how much they put carbon dioxide in there, there's still not enough to bring the temperature above the, uh, above the freezing point. Part of the problem was that back in the past, the sun itself was dimmer. And, and you know, since Mars is further away and it's cold now, and the sun on top of was dimmer than it is today, it's really, really hard to explain why the uh, ancient Mars, when you had less sun to begin with, you know, was actually warmer than it is today. This is ongoing, this is, uh, is, is a mystery, it's, a, it's still a point of debate, and the leading hypotheses are that there were several different types of greenhouse gases in the Martian atmosphere, some, some want to say this was nitrogen, uh, nitrogen oxides, uh, some actually invoking methane, uh, which provide additional warming and kept kept the surface warmer than it is uh, than it is today, and uh, and therefore allowed liquid water on the surface. Climate today, well, climate today is mostly it's you know what we see is a is a seasonal <clears throat> freezing of uh, of CO two of carbon dioxide in the poles, so. As, as Mars goes around the sun, you know, just like what we have, uh, winter, winter and, uh, and summer seasons, uh, on Mars, the difference is that the main gas of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, freezes out. So <clears throat> on Earth, water freezes out, but this is not the main gas. We have nitrogen and oxygen, right? So whatever here, even if you go to Antarctica, you still have roughly the same amount of, of air. Not the same thing on Mars. On Mars, if you have winter, you can have one third of the pressure drop of the total atmospheric mass because it will freeze out in the polar region, and then and then it comes out. So this that's what dictates the the weather on Mars. All right. Um, we have a couple of more questions related to climate. Will you take them or? Um, okay. Ha, ha, All right. Uh, you're on time. Okay. Go go ahead. A couple more. I'll take. Uh, just two more. One is. Has an asteroid ever hit Mars and caused change in climate? 
and what happened to the greenhouse gases? Why have they disappeared? Well, that's a both loaded question. So uh, the asteroid is, yes, absolutely. That's why we see this large craters, Gale Crater, where the curiosity is right now. This is impact. And the, um, uh, you know, if you look at the, you know, the terrain in general, there's a plenty of, if you look, particularly you look in the southern hemisphere, it's, you know, there are tons of craters which are going back, you know, and this is all the impact craters. In fact, uh, the uh, crater count is usually uh, used by people who are looking careful at the surface of Mars to detect how much, how old is that particular surface is. The idea is that the more craters you have, the older the, 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 the surface is. Yes, there were certainly uh, um, papers which said, were suggesting that if you hit uh, the uh, uh, if you hit Mars with a good uh, with a good sized asteroid, uh, then you can uh, release enough of the volatiles into the atmosphere to temporarily increase the um, uh, probably, uh, temporarily increase the temperature. That was the case, you know. So I haven't read those papers recently, so I don't know if this idea just died or. Uh, it just people don't believe that anymore but that was certainly like about 15 years that was when people were proposing that um and the other one was about the greenhouse gases so the greenhouse gases some are easy to explain some are not uh the idea that you had more um, uh, carbon dioxide than it is today uh well it comes because you'll have active volcanoes and right now we don't. I mean, there's huge volcanoes on Mars, right? Olympus Mons, but they're not active. You know, you might have some seepage from CO2, but you know, from from the interior, but you don't you don't see it. You don't. It's not. It's not like what on Earth where you have uh, constantly have eruptions. So, <clears throat> because Mars is colder, you you don't have that source of, of CO2 coming out. Um, the other ones are more uh, kind of speculative to explain like some people were claiming that uh the uh the atmosphere was more hydrogen rich back in the past and hydrogen just simply escaped again mars small planet that couldn't keep it maybe maybe not <laughs> you know there's no there is no measurement which was put forward for that hypothesis some people were saying also about the invoking the nitrogen oxides as additional uh, greenhouse gas that requires a very active sun you know so it's still again it's a mystery uh, people do not agree how to keep ancient mars warm but it was warm obviously so this is one of the of the active uh, active uh, planetary mysteries how to keep it you know so as imperfect as that is right now the increased greenhouse is the leading hypothesis for that Thank you so much. That was absolutely great. All right. And you, you have this gift of, you know, showing the big picture on the right level, yeah. you know, which is nice and clear and all connected. So oh. we really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, Mar Mars is, a, you know, just don't get this impression that we know everything. You know, this is, the more we learn about Mars, the more mysteries are just like in the face. Like even the picture which is right now on the screen, this variability, nobody can explain it. We measure it, but we can't explain it. We have something to study, yes? Yeah, so yeah. we so have more interesting things to explore. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Goodbye.